Good morning, good day, and good evening to all our attendees joining us for today's latest Data Science Central webinar. I'd like to start our event off today by thanking Pivotal for sponsoring today's event. <clears throat> this is Pivotal's third educational webinar as part of a series this year in partnership with Data Science Central, also known as the Pivotal Data Labs webinar series. Pivotal is a wonderful partner and supporter of the Data Science Central community, and we are honored to have them sponsoring our event today. I would also like to take this opportunity to mention and show our appreciation for some of our other recent sponsors, including Stack IQ, Cisco, Tableau, Teradata, Splunk, and Tibco, to name just a few. These past webinars are available on demand at datasciencecentral.com, and if you have not had the opportunity to view them, I would encourage you to do so, as they do provide some very useful information. Today's webinar is entitled, From Data Silos to Data Lakes. And before we begin, I would like to briefly review the format of today's webinar. Today's event will be approximately one hour long. We have a single panelist that I'll introduce. Introduce to all of you in just a, mu just a moment. <clears throat> Excuse me. We should have about 10 to 15 minutes for Q&A following today's presentation. And this webinar is being taped and will be made available later on this afternoon at datasciencecentral.com. I'd also like to encourage our attendees to provide questions throughout the presentation. We will be reviewing them and presenting them on your behalf during the Q&A portion of today's event. My name is Tim Madison, and I am one of the co-founders of Data Science Central, and I will be your host for today's webinar. I'm very pleased to introduce today's panelist, Ken Dowling of Pivotal. Ken is a principal data engineer at Pivotal with, o with over 25 years of experience architecting, developing, and implementing successful, very large databases and big data solutions, including many data warehouse, business intelligence, and management reporting solutions. Ken has provided technical leadership to VLDB and big data installations for Informix software, Netiza, and Greenplum, with an emphasis on scalability and performance. Ken, thanks for being with us this morning. We're looking forward to your presentation. In today's webinar, Ken will be discussing how IT departments have long applied a strong discipline of managing, storing, and protecting enterprise data. But as we move into the age of big data and cloud, this era of traditional application or organization-centric data silos is nearing its end. The evolution from data silos to information infrastructure ecosystems, otherwise known as data lakes, will accelerate data-driven insights, application development, and time to value. In today's webinar, we will focus on the impact of data lakes, <clears throat> excuse me, and how, it can, and how IT can architect and utilize them to achieve business goals. Ken will also provide some specifics regarding the development of technology stack for data lake, and you will also learn about how data lakes are helping organizations secure strategic advantages, and improve their bottom line. So with that, Ken, I'm going to turn it over to you, and you can begin as soon as you're ready to go. Ken? Uh, thanks, Tim. There you go. Um, yep. Uh, from a, just a quick operational thing, do you see the correct slide in terms of the, my title slide? Uh, yep, you're ready to go. Yeah, your first slide is there. All right, thank you. Um, are so you not seeing you the introduction, Tim? I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, you, you, are you seeing the same slide? If not, I can help you progress the slide. And if I forward, did you see me forward? Yep, you're good. Okay. If you're having any trouble, just let me know, and I'll progress the slide for you. I'm fine now. Thank you. Sorry. Okay. Um, okay. Sorry, everyone, for that little operational thing. Uh, thanks for that introduction, Tim, and I'd like to also thank everyone for joining today. So the goal for today is to you know chat about you know, moving from data silos to data lakes, as the title um, says, and that's really about moving from kind of an enterprise data warehouse or a data mart kind of methodology to uh, evolving architectures to embrace big data. And by big data, we're referring to the concepts of big data and how we process and how we ingest data, but also technical architectures to support kind of the new concepts that we're embracing. And at Pivotal, we have kind of three kind of core tenants that we, you know, um, that we are working with. And the first one is store everything. The second is analyze anything. 
And the third is to build the right thing. So from a store anything, everything standpoint, the goal is to create a rich data repository to meet evolving business needs, because that's really what's driving this, is the business wants access to all of this large data. And it is really about developing and building an infrastructure to manage ever-growing data volumes. The second one about analyzing anything is really to start to bring data together from disparate data sources breaking down the data silos and bringing it into a single repository where we can really you know, kind of do mashups of this data and, and find new uh, data insights for the business. And the third one, which we're not going to spend a lot of time on today, is really about building the right thing. And that is really about using you know, the store everything and the analyze anything outputs so that we can really impact the bottom line of the business. So as we go forward, you know, what problem are we really trying to solve here in terms of you know, embracing this big data uh, notion? And it is um, what IDC terms as the big data utility gap. And what we're trying to do is solve that challenge that we have of we're generating more and more data, whether that's customers, whether that's sensors inside of you know, jet engines, whether it's a wind turbine you know, uh, generating sensor data, uh, for our you know, output, for um, you know, wind speeds, et cetera. And a challenge that we run into is that we're generating large, large volumes of data. And these are just some example numbers on the screen here of 70 and, you know, and 80 percent. But if you think of that, we generate a lot of data, but we leave some of it on the floor from the start. And then 80 um, percent of that data is being stored. and you know, from that perspective, it gets even worse because when it comes to analyzing that data, we're you know, going after a very small percentage of it. So 3%, again, these are the IDC numbers on this side of the screen, 3% is being prepared for analysis. Of that, we're not even looking at all that data. So all that data we're putting into the data warehouse, some of it we actually you know, you know, aren't even looking at. And then the next step is really oper operationalization of that um, analysis. So once we do the analysis, getting that out to, you know, our, you know, to really impact our customers, a very tiny percentage is being, um, is being analyzed. So with that, we're following the lead of you know, some of the first movers in this big data space. You know, obviously, Google, Facebook, Yahoo, those types of companies were definitely at the forefront of the, the big data um, movement, obviously Hadoop coming from you know the white papers out of Google, et cetera, and Facebook doing a very good job of analyzing and storing all of the data that they're generating. But that is also now migrating over towards um, the, you know kind of the I'll say the non dot com side of the the enterprises that are out there. So you know corporations like GE, Southwest, NYSE um, for the stock markets. You know, are starting to adopt the same type of methodology of closing this gap between um, what data is being generated and what's being analyzed. And as we look at this, um, you know, this slide really demonstrates that big data is everywhere. Um, you know, in the upper left we have retailers shown there, and you know, two decades ago retailers were at the forefront of the enterprise data warehouse kind of movement or the adoption of that, and you know, with the advent of uh, online shopping and, and online retailers, you know, those data volumes have, you know, greatly increased. But other industries have really taken off as well. So manufacturing and energy specifically, you know, if you think of sensors inside of machinery, um, you know, the Internet of Things that is definitely coming, those data volumes and the, the amount of data that they generate in a given minute or a given second is uh, pretty phenomenal. Um, one one example of this is uh, a jet engine from General Electric can actually have over 500 sensors in it, and that those sensors can be producing data every one second, or some of them even produce it at an eighth of a second time frame. So if you think of that for the entire duration of a flight, 500 sensors at least one second intervals for data generation. Um, and then if you, you know, that's just one engine, and then you expand that across the fleet of uh, airplanes, and it can be, uh, you know, quite a, a lot of uh, data to be storing and analyzing. 
So in terms of, you know, there's definitely a need. We've seen that on the prior slides that the businesses are definitely generating a lot more data. But how has the technology industry responded so that we can actually store that data and process that data? And, you know, this is a somewhat pivotal-centric slide, but it does show, like, some of the new technologies that have evolved over the, the, the last few years so that we could actually um, you know, process these large sets of data. Um, you know, from an application perspective, and again, we're not going to talk a lot about that part today, but application perspective, you know, there's um, a lot of new technologies for platform as a service um, for quickly and rapidly developing and deploying uh, applications and kind of closing that loop with operationalizing all of the analytics that come out of the big data space. From an analytics and discovery, there's a lot of new capabilities uh, being developed there or new technologies just because of the underlying data store. So we go to that third box with data organization and management. The key um, technology there that's really driving the adoption of big data in the enterprise is Hadoop. So with that stack of um, technologies, we're able to start to address um, you know, what big data means and, and how to deploy that inside of uh, a corporation. So taking that technology stack, we've got big data being generated, we've got this new technology stack that can allow us to store and process that data. So what do we do? How do we get some value out of that? And the goal here is to kind of um, take this journey towards what we call a data-driven enterprise. You want to ingest the data so that, in, in this case, we called it archives. So archive that data. And it is, again, about storing everything. Get as much data into your data lake as possible and store that, start to integrate that, and, and bring that data set together to find new value for the business. And that's really that second piece, which is the data analysis aspect of it. You know, this is for Data Science Central, so you know, a lot of data scientists on the phone probably, and this is your sweet spot in terms of doing the analysis of these large volumes of data. And then as we continue on that spectrum, you move to um, uh, building apps that can basically take some of those data models, some of those uh, uh, mathematical models and deploy those and give that you know, feedback loop to the customer, to the business, to impact the business. And then you know, creating new revenue streams is obviously another interesting um, aspect of this. Uh, one customer of ours has actually brought disparate data sets together, done some work, uh, what we call distilling that, and we'll talk about that in a, a few slides, um, but basically creating value by bringing data sets together, and they actually have a new business model or a new port part of their business model, which is actually selling this data set to other companies. So credit agencies are willing to pay for this integrated data set that you know, they initially just built for their own internal uses. So you know, from a, a business model perspective, it can be the actual data itself, or it can be new applications for your customers, for your end users. Um, and then as a repeatable framework, again, we're not going to talk about uh, platform as a service much today, but it is really about things like Cloud Foundry uh, and being able to rapidly deploy and scale applications. You know, the bottom arrow in this uh, slide does show that you know, across this data-driven enterprise, the, you know, really the underpinning of this is the data lake that makes this possible. So it's definitely a little harder than it sounds. It made it, you know, sounds nice and easy. Oh, you just take all your data and store it in this data lake and start to, you know, do some processing. Um, but obviously, it's been a challenge through the years. Um, and, you know, if we think about meeting these challenges of, well, we have batch processing requirements, we have near real-time requirements, we have real-time requirements. And if you think of traditional EDW, um, architectures, they've really focused more on the far right of this slide, which is the batch processing side. And the new requirements from the business are definitely um, driving towards real-time and near real-time requirements. Um, and then it gets even a little 
more complex when you start to think about how does this um, how does this change when you start to think about the different um, organizations within the business. So you've got you know finance with its own requirements and own data sets and manufacturing and marketing, and this is obviously the traditional siloed view of IT systems. You know, in bringing this all together in a single kind of old school traditional EDW architecture is definitely not feasible. And and some of the reasons that it's not feasible, one is the cost. Um, you know, some of the traditional um, EDW architectures um, definitely can be costly as you get into petabyte scale. And the other is the actual scaling of the system. So some of these systems at, at petabyte scales um, don't perform well enough and are difficult to manage, et cetera. So we really needed some a new way to to bring this data together. And we talked about the technologies for doing that. And the concept here is of a business data lake. <clears throat> so it is really about an architectural shift to meet data volumes and data integration requirements that can't be met with traditional architectures. So if we look at the this slide here and we start kind of at the bottom, it's that, again, that notion of store everything. And this starts out by saying store everything as is. And what we like to think about here is storing the raw data. So bringing in that raw data from all of the, the source systems and then working with the data in that kind of from that raw format. So it's not a lot of effort up front in terms of cleansing and transformation and things like that um, to bring the data into the data lake. You bring it in and it's kind of like its raw format. And this can change or be different depending upon your industry. Um, I met with one um, one of our customers, and they basically just said the raw data is too raw for their end users, and they've given direct access to that raw data just to have the user say, yeah, that's a little scary. We need it cleansed a little bit. Um, but then there's other industries, usually around security, um, and, and fraud detection where you don't want to do any cleansing because the cleansing may actually hide or you know, eliminate some of the fraud that would have been detected with the algorithms. But bringing in all of that data is kind of the key foundation here again. And it is about bringing in the, the structure and the unstructured data sets. <clears throat> and then for distilling on demand, it is really about looking at the data when it needs when it, the analysis is needed so it's creating sandboxes for end users for so for the data scientists to come in and have the ability to for lack of a better term kind of play around with the data see what they can find see what they can discover and doing that kind of before you put in the energy and the effort to um, you know really cleanse the data and you know kind of put in governance and all of that can really um, speed things up in terms of time to value. You know, it, it doesn't take six months of the EDW team time to you know build objects and cleanse it and build ETL jobs, et cetera. It's bring the data in, provide tools to the data scientists, to the end users so that they can query and, and get at that data to find the, the nuggets of gold, if you will. And really the kind of the, the language here, um, you know, the second bullet point there says, you know, business-friendly tooling, and it is still really about SQL. Um, it's, uh, you know, obviously MapReduce is out there. There's scripting languages like Pig, et cetera. But, you know, ultimately the end users in terms of especially business users, you know, the data scientists are usually different. There's the different skill set, but some of your um, kind of your business users are still focused in the SQL-based world. So it is really about trying to provide tools that make them efficient with the data very quickly. The other thing here is, and as we go up the, this uh, chart, <coughs> is um, you know encouraging local requirements. And it is about kind of getting out of the way of the business. So oftentimes, in the, you know, also again, going back to the traditional EDW uh, world, the business makes a request, and the EDW team has to respond and say, well, okay, that's going to take us you know, three weeks to do this, and then we can build this aggregate, and we'll get you that report, et cetera. That time, you know, is, is 
put on the kind of the overworked EDW team because all of these requests are coming in. And the goal here is to really kind of flip it and to say, look, if you need access to this data, there's the data, here's your tools to go access it, you can go access that data. So it is about kind of the business enablement and then allowing them to decide what data matters and what data is um, important to them and how they want to do their analysis, et cetera. And then governing where it matters, where it matters is, um, this is a challenge for a lot of enterprises, and it's a, a challenge as you build your data lake because you have a lot of data sources coming in. You've got you know, different groups working with different data sets or similar data sets. So it is, um, the key thing I want to mention here is really about having some balance and govern as needed. But if a line of business, let's say, needs a transient data set for two months to do a special project, um, there's no real need to govern that if it's just going to be for that business unit and for that, you know, for a short time period. So um, while this is necessary in terms of traceability of data sets, you know, throughout kind of their life, um, definitely don't, I'll say, don't overdo the, the master data management and the, the governance aspects of these because that will preclude, you know, any of the speed and performance gains you may have. So from a, uh, a generic data lake architecture then, so as we move into kind of what's this, you know, what does this look like in terms of providing um, to, the, to, to the end user an architecture they can work with. Um, on the left, you know, we have our traditional data sources. Um, and the key thing to point out here is that there's definite changes in, in how the data is coming in. And we're going to talk about this in a little bit more in a few slides. But it's, at the bottom there, we see you know, batch ingestion. And that was, again, the traditional EDW. Um, and I don't mean to bash traditional EDWs. I've had a long, good career and, and still do um, based on EDWs. But that was kind of the traditional way of bringing data in. Hey, it was once a night, we load all this data in, we may update some aggregates, et cetera. But with data lakes and with the new business requirements, we're moving or having to move to an architecture that supports multiple types of ingestion. So we have real-time ingestion needs. So that might be streaming data. I mentioned um, sensors like, let's say, on a wind turbine. Well, that sensor on a wind turbine can send data um, basically every second. They can send, a, you know, here's what my current status is in terms of wind speed and blade angle of the turbine blades, et cetera. So all of that information comes in real time. And we've got to have an architecture that accepts real time. We can do micro batch as well, or we need to support the traditional batch style, um, you know, kind of that once a night or once a week kind of thing. And that's really a difference between traditional architectures and the data lake architecture. It's that kind of being able to deal with multiple types of ingestion there. And then on the far right, we've got kind of the same exact thing again. We've got a change in how we're kind of consuming this data. So this action tier that we have, um, there's real-time insights that we need to support. There's interactive ones, and there's batch, you know, kind of the scheduled report again. So you know, we'll go through some of this in a little more detail, but definitely, you know, the architecture needs to support different ways to bring data in, as well as then consume it as it's coming out of the system. And then in the middle of the the screen there, we've got this, um, you know, what we would call the data lake architecture. So at the bottom of that, you know, kind of the the foundation is. Um, HDFS, so the Hadoop file system as the data store. There's a distillation tier that we have, and again, we'll talk about that in a little more detail, but that is really to bring data from HDFS to other sources or other um, structures that may uh, or that can use that data. So we can distill data up, let's say, to a, an MPP database, or we can bring that data into an in-memory database. Um, and we'll see a, uh, an example of that or talk a little bit more about that in a slide or two. Um, there's obviously a processing tier in here, so providing analytic interfaces and, as I mentioned, giving the, the end users access to this environment and this data lake um, through most likely uh, SQL interfaces, as we can see there, too. Um, 
So moving forward on this one then, as we think about what I mentioned earlier in terms of these four key kind of components of a data lake, I'm going to quickly flip this to kind of what Pivotal offers in this space, and then we'll drill in a little further. So at the bottom again, we'll go bottom up, store everything. Uh, we've got Pivotal Hadoop. It's a, a full Apache Hadoop distribution. Um, you know, and it's, again, low cost and simplified deployment and really about, you know, massive scale and storing all of your data. For distilling on demand, we've got things like Hawk, which is our Hadoop uh, query engine. So it's a SQL engine that runs on top of the HDFS file system. So that's where we're providing that simple, easy to use SQL interface for our end users to access the data. Uh, and it basically provides a very structured SQL on Hadoop there. And we use this for some for pure analytics right on the Hadoop environment, but also we can use this for data movement and transformation as well. So it provides a really good engine for um, transforming, et cetera. And then on the Encourage local requirements side, we've got two products there. Again, Hawk, which is our um, structured SQL engine on Hadoop. And then there's a product called Gemfire, which gives us a in-memory database, as well as providing real-time analytics and integration on top of Hadoop. So it's in-memory while we're running and processing, but the data is persisted to the HDFS file system. So it provides a very um, low latency, high throughput, high transaction number um, environment, but it still can be backed up by the Hadoop file system. And then on the governance side, we are working on some products in that space, but currently we don't have anything specific to offer there. So I'm going to skip that and uh, head towards what this architecture diagram looks like as we think about um, kind of overlaying some of the pivotal products on top of this. So on the left, we have our sources again, and you know, let's say we've got clickstream data or sensor data coming in. Well, we can use our Gemfire XD product or our Spring XD product um, to bring that data into the Hadoop environment. And the, the interesting thing, example here would be, let's say I, I mentioned wind turbines, and the basic, if a wind turbine, if the, they can rotate the blades on that, and if the blade rotates too far, it can actually damage the turbine. Um, so if there's a sensor on there that senses, hey, this blade has rotated too far, the Gemfire XD interface can actually monitor that stream as it comes in and catch that and say, hey, this turbine has an issue because the blade's rotated too far. And it can do that in real time as opposed to waiting for that to get into you know, the Hadoop environment and then for somebody to run a report or some type of analytics on that. This gives you that real-time capability for you know, capturing that information and spawning a request for some for a, a repair agent to, to inspect that uh, that turbine. So some pretty interesting capabilities there, and it can also do some analytics on the fly as well. So if you're looking for the average wind speed out of a certain range for a, a, a wind park, this can also do that type of analytics as well on the fly. And as we come down a little further, as we start to think about kind of micro-batch data, we can do, you know, Spring XD, which is a, a, a Spring-based interface that, again, interfaces with uh, right to Hadoop. Um, we can still use Gemfire for that as well. Um, and then there's some open source capabilities with Scoop and Flume as well that can bring data in kind of this micro-batch format into uh, Pivotal HD. And then the same with batch. You know, batch processing you know, is, is fairly well known in terms of the, um, you know, the, the architecture and the tools, et cetera, for supporting that as well. And as we look at the middle tier, you know, we have a pivotal Hadoop offering there. There's our distillation tier. And as we go up, the, we see a box there with you know, the green plum database slash hawk. So we, as we need an MPP environment, we can you know, a traditional MPP relational database environment, I'll say, we can leverage the Greenplum database there, or we can leverage the Hawk um, query engine, which actually runs directly on top of Hadoop. Um, the real-time processing, we have Pivotal uh, Gemfire XD, as I mentioned. Um, there's Spring XD and Uzi for um, 
certain controlling the, uh, and data movement as well. And then at the top, we can see our Pivotal Command Center, which gives us this unified operations tier that helps us manage and control and deploy Pivotal HD, Hawk, and Gemfire XD. So um, a, a kind of this unified view of your environment there. So as we think about these architectures and we've seen how the business needs are driving new technology architectures, let's look at some of the concepts of the data lake at this point. So we've kind of drilled into a little bit of the architecture here, but we'll just talk about some of the concepts here and what's in definitions that are different in terms of kind of the traditional EDW, which we have on the right, and kind of the, the business data lake. And we are you know, going for this notion of a common data model, but it's really around a common view of the data, but with flexibility so that the business can create kind of local data sets on their own and work with you know, what we're calling derived classes here or local data. So it's about making data available to the users, giving them tools like Hawk or like um, GPDB so that they can then, in like a sandbox environment, create their own data sets that are kind of subsets of this global or this big data lake that we've created. From a data quality perspective, you know, the, the challenge with EDWs is it's always, you know, a burden to a certain extent to make sure the data is cleansed ahead of time and that the quality is good and that it's accurate, et cetera. And, you know, some companies are running some of the financials of the organization off of the EDW as well. So in that scenario, Obviously, data quality is, is very important, but it also impacts the, um, the agility of, the, you know, of getting new data into the environment. And in this scenario here with the data lake is, you know, maybe some of the, the, you know, maybe some of the data is imperfect. You know, maybe not everything is cleansed, that not every value has been totally validated, et cetera. But getting the data to the end users more quickly should outweigh any of those issues. And then more importantly is if there's value to be found in that data, the value will be found, and maybe the operationalization of that value becomes it's part of the EDW or it's part of another application, and then it's worth the effort to invest in cleansing that data and making sure that that data is clean and, and usable. But up front, you may not be sure, certain if it's worth the effort. So definitely you know, keep that in mind is that, you know, when do you need to have the data cleansed? And usually on the quality side, um, it's okay in the data lake to have um, imperfect data. And then for data integration, this is really just about structured versus unstructured. Um, obviously, EDWs are primarily um, uh, RDBMS-based, so very structured data with cubes and or tables and views and things like that where the data lake becomes a, a, a very interesting mix of data, whether it's PDFs or whether it's uh, the, the Twitter firehose from Gannett, uh, whether it's Facebook data that's being um, looked at, et cetera. So you know, it could be image, it could be video, it could be text, et cetera. So the, the thought there is to bring this all together and then have the tools available to, to look at it. And then for multiple interfaces to the environment, we definitely, you know, in the EDW side have that dialed in in terms of SQL access is the primary use case. Um, there's tools out there, MicroStrategies, Business Objects of the World, et cetera, um, sometimes doing analytics with SAS and R. Um, but in the business data lake side, there's going to be a lot more interfaces, a lot more flexibility with how you process that data. Um, there's some listed there, MapReduce, some NoSQL languages, there's uh, PIG. Um, there's a lot of different ways that you can um, analyze that data um, in terms of, and, and use the tool that's appropriate. So we've done some video analytics, and doing video analytics obviously requires specific tools around that as well. So, And the key things with this is to do everything kind of as quickly as possible. So you want an environment that we have speed of deployment and access of data. We want to do it as low cost as possible, which again is where some of the open source tools and Hadoop, et cetera, comes into play um, as well. So, so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the components of the data lake and then drill into the architectures and some of the requirements some more here. So 
you know, from talk, touched on this a bit in terms of structured and unstructured data, but it is really about storing everything as cost efficiently as possible, and that's really where the pivotal Hadoop um, and just Hadoop in general, HDFS in general, comes into play. It is about ingesting data and getting that data into the environment across different or meeting the different um, ingestion requirements that we talked about. So is it real time? Is it near real time? Uh, is it batch oriented, et cetera? And we've got um, various tools there with Gemfire XD, Spring XD, and then obviously the landing pad of Pivotal HD for Hadoop as well. The distillation piece is interesting because here we just kind of call it out as it's ETL. Um, and to a certain extent it is, um, but the, the goal is, is to load the data into the data lake first and then worry about doing some of the cleansing, which is kind of that traditional ETL kind of a space. Um, so we, we you know, kind of coined a new term here for it um, just to make sure that it doesn't get confused with um, ETL, and again, ETL is a necessary component of an enterprise data warehouse, but um, can be somewhat of a burdensome process and take a long time to develop, et cetera. And the goal here is to enable the end users to kind of distill this data on their own, so let them work with the data sets that, as they see it and, uh, and not put up barriers to getting to it. And by barriers, I mean not barriers for you know making sure the data is cleansed and validated, et cetera. Working with some of that imperfect data, as I mentioned. And then from a processing side, it is the goal of being able to run you know analytical algorithms, user queries, with different kind of end user requirements. Meaning, is this a real time response? Meaning, I've got to have a response back sub-second, or is this something that is interactive, so eh, if it's three or four seconds, I'm good with that, or is this a scheduled report that is going to run for, you know, 35 minutes before it spits something out. From that perspective, um, you know, we've got different processing available there, so with Hadoop, you know, obviously I mentioned PIG, and there's MapReduce, you know, core MapReduce jobs, there could be HBases in there as well. Hawk is our query engine on top of Hadoop which provides you kind of that interactive access and some batch access. And then for real-time response time, uh, we have the Pivotal Gemfire XD uh, product, which is our in-memory uh, database and in-memory analytics engine. And then next, um, you know, we want to be able to take action on this data. It is about, you know, finding, um, you know, ways to change the business, finding new business models, et cetera, and it is taking the, the models and the, the results of these queries and this analysis and putting that into a, a production space. So in here, we've kind of referred to, our, you know, we can use RabbitMQ, our Cloud Foundry offering, and again, the in-memory uh, database with Gemfire to help operationalize this, uh, this space. <coughs> You know, and for the unified data management, I mentioned this earlier in terms of, um, you know, the data life cycle and traceability of the data as it moves through the environment. And, you know, we're working on some products in this space. We don't have anything specific, but this has always been a challenge in terms of, you know, whether it's a data warehouse environment or this new evolving data lake space. Um, the key thing that I will mention here, again, is to not over-engineer this and not over make too many processes around this so that you're impacting, you know, getting work done there. And then uh, from us, our perspective, again, is a unified management console, a, a way of managing this space or the, all of this, te this technology so that um, you make sure that, you know, SLAs are being met, that user requirement, you know, have access to the data, that the, the system is, you know, basically up and healthy as well. So a few terminology things that I've been kind of saying, but I wanted to just call them out here specifically before we get back into the, the architecture piece. Um, and we talked about new requirements for ingesting data. So there's these four concepts here that were you know, mentioned. So streaming data, bringing data in, and doing the collection of that, doing on-the-fly scoring or analytics of that data. Um, as that event actually happens. Uh, very important component for uh, data lake. Micro batch, 
Um, this is just you know, dealing with small, um, frequent, um, possibly files, but possibly also events from a stream that's coming in. But it's uh, you know maybe every five seconds dealing with a set of data, or maybe it's every 30 seconds dealing with a set of data. From a batch standpoint, it's something that EDWs have you know, relied on for for decades, and that's basically the you know once a night or the twice a day or once a week batch loading of data. And then there's a term that we call mega batch as well, which is um, infrequent uh, and usually very large data sets that are, are loaded into the data lake. Uh, they may be once quarterly, um, but the key thing to note is that from a, for these four things, streaming, micro-batch, batch, and mega-batch, as you architect your data lake for ingestion of data, those are the four things you need to think about and that you need to support. On the other side, on the kind of the action side, We've got real-time response requirements, so basically a very low latency, that kind of sub-second response time requirement. We have a, what we would call an interactive response time, so the user has to wait for the results, but if it's usually with you know, less than 30 seconds or so, that's interactive. If it's, you know, the user has to take a coffee break to wait for, uh, for, to wait for that response, that's going to be more of a batch type of uh, processing. And then the last one that we have called out here is the near real-time response. So, you know, higher latency than real-time, but maybe, again, within a minute or two of, of, uh, of the, the request. And these concepts are pretty straightforward, but, again, the, the point here is to drive home the fact that a data lake has different architectural requirements driven by these different business requirements of being able to support real-time Micro batch and batch ingestion of data, and then on the right, being able to take action in different ways, doing real time action, real or interactive, and then batch uh, insights as well. So having this the product stack as well as the the infrastructure in place to support these um, these varying requirements is definitely a, an important uh, part of the architecture. So as we drop down into the interfaces a little bit, as I mentioned, we're bringing data in and we're taking data out of this environment. So in the upper left, we can see you know, a little table with different types of uh, ingestion. So we called out streaming, micro-batch, batch, and mega-batch. And then as we go down that table, we can see there's different products. Some of those are pivotal products. Some of those, like Scoop, uh, Flume, et cetera, are open source. And then some of those are with our partners as well, so uh, some of the ETL partners. So from that perspective, you know, this table kind of shows you, you know, you can match up your specific requirements with a, a product on the left there. So for streaming data, we've got Gemfire XD support, Spring XD support, and Flume are, are great at streaming data. You know, if you need analytics on top of that stream, uh, Gemfire XD is definitely the way to go. On the, on the upper right, we can see um, interfaces here in terms of getting data out. So, um, you know, we've got Gemfire XD for real-time access, interactive access. Um, Hawk SQL can be used for batch interactive, et cetera. And then just to call out on the lower right, we have um, BI tool support as well. So we can use things like MicroStrategy and business objects against traditional SQL structures like Hawk and Hive as well. And the, I have a few slides with some quadrants on here. I'll go through these kind of quickly. Um, but we have um, you know, this notion of, well, which product do I use where again? And it, mm -hmm. the prior slides showed a little bit of this. But as we start to think about if I'm dealing with events coming in in a streaming fashion, so the upper left quadrant there on the the, uh, the leftmost chart, you know, Pivotal Gemfire XD is perfect for that. And if you need analytics on top of that, that works as well. Micro batch, we can do you know Gemfire and Spring as well. Uh, we can do traditional data loading for mega batch kind of operations in there. And on the right, you kind of see you know what the throughput requirements are. So Gemfire XD being an in-memory database has a much higher throughput than the, the Spring XD component as well. 
for data access, so accessing data. Similar kind of a chart here in terms of what languages and what type of uh, data am I working with can kind of dictate my tools. And it really just wants to drive home, one, the positioning of the individual tools that's available there, but also um, what's required for the data lake. You know, you can't just say, here's SQL. You have to say, well, here's SQL, but if you need something that's unstructured data, well, maybe that's PIG, maybe that's MapReduce as well. And then lastly, on the data distillation tier, how do you cleanse this data a bit for, you know, kind of the, the business to use it? Um, there's different tools here. A lot of customers are using Hawk for that cleansing aspect. A lot are using MapReduce, and a lot are using PIG. Um, and then also, there's also third-party tools that we're partnered with, like Datamir, et cetera, that can help with kind of some of the data prep and that data distillation. So in terms of kind of an example kind of architecture that we, uh, this is very high level, but was put together for a gaming company, um, you know, as we think about apps and devices sending data in, uh, and this a gaming company, um, you know, may have specific customer actions that are happening on the casino floor, those can come into Gemfire XD. We can process that data, do some real-time analytics on that. Um, while that then gets persisted to HDFS. So the Gemfire XD is in memory, but it will persist data stores out to HDFS. They have streams of data coming in from uh, other, scenario, other uh, casino systems, and that could, those can flow through Spring XD, which is just basically a way of loading data into HDFS, but without kind of the real-time analytic component. We have batch data streams that come in just straight into HDFS. So all of the data residing in HDFS. We then use Hadoop. We can then use just some ELT with the Greenplum environment um, to kind of cleanse that data, transform that data a bit, and make that available through query engines. And they use both Hawk, which queries directly on top of Hadoop, but they also do some extracting to a more of a data warehouse environment that runs with the Greenplum database. And then at the top there, we've got analytic tools that are basically doing some of the anal analysis in place on the data as it resides in the database or on Hadoop, and some analytic tools that pulls the data sets out, et cetera, for you know, analysis. So as we you know, kind of wrap up this, we'll get to some questions then, but you know, going back to our, our three uh, kind of core tenets here you know, about storing everything, and the goal here is to build your data lake to support different ingestion methods, uh, to support um, different types of data that you're bringing in, structured and unstructured, and we want to be able to, to analyze um, anything inside of there as well. So it is making those right tools available um, and enable the business with those tools with direct access to the data so that they can work with that data. And then also then building the right thing. And this is really about taking the action out of the environment. So you know, working with, let's say, a platform as a service uh, type architecture so that you can quickly deploy and enable applications that are taking advantage of some of the insights that are coming out of uh, the data lake space. So, and with that, I will wrap up. And I think at this point, I will turn control back over to Tim. Great. Thank you, Ken. That was a really great presentation and a lot of very useful information. So we had a lot of questions come in, and uh, we're going to try to get to as many as we can. But uh, just before we start uh, the Q&A portion, I want to make sure everyone sees the current slide. If you have additional questions for Ken, you can take down his email address here and uh, you know, send him a note or a question following today's webinar. So, uh, Ken, the first question is, uh, are you saying that the, e the EDW, March, et cetera, will get created from the data lake environment through the distilled process, or does data lake coexist as a parallel environment? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, and I'm going to answer it with a, it depends on your environment. Um, I, the, the gaming company, that example that I was using, the goal there was for everything to flow to HDFS first, and then from there move forward into their EDW. Um, I have talked with other customers who basically they kind of split their data and uh, quite a bit of it will go into HDFS first. 
uh, but some of it will flow directly to the EDW as well. So sometimes they, and it can depend, they can dual feed it, so they can send the data to both the EDW environment and the Hadoop environment. Um, but it really depends on the business requirements there. Um, I think a lot of existing EDWs um, to try and change their process of where they get their data from would be burdensome. So you're probably better off dual feeding it so that just for expediency's sake you can get your Hadoop data lake up running quickly versus trying to change the entire infrastructure for how you source data to your EDW. Okay, very very thoughtful answer. Uh, you did speak a little bit about structured and unstructured data, but this uh, attendee is asking you to speak, I guess, a little more detail of how you would, uh, combining structured and unstructured data, how critical it is, and how hard is it to do? Um, it, it can be challenging. Um, from a, a data science perspective, our data science team has done um, a bit, quite a bit of work with unstructured data around, and one specifically was around video anal analysis. And obviously, there's kind of metadata that goes along with the the video stream. So it is, you know, kind of the glue that holds the structure and the unstructured together is actually kind of metadata about the unstructured data, um, especially in this case because it was a video stream. So there was, you know, a lot of kind of I'll say textual structured data about the video stream. So that was kind of our connection between those two. Um, there's other, you know, what I would call unstructured data, like, you know, just even JSON. So like the GNIP stream coming in um, the, of the Twitter firehose, that JSON structure is, um, we'll just say complex, and for lack of a better term, I'll say kind of ugly. Um, so part of what we did there was actually write tools to strip out you know, the JSON and make it more of a structured format um, that is more SQL friendly. And so when I say structured, I tend to, you know, JSON is obviously structured, but um, it's structured in a way that doesn't work well with SQL. So our goal there was to kind of change the format and kind of rip that out of JSON and into a more structured format. So a lot's just going to depend on what kind of data you're dealing with um, in terms of the, the unstructured nature of it and is it metadata stuff that can be pulled out or can the actual data be transformed from unstructured to structured. Okay, very good. And you know, for those of you listening, if you have additional questions related to that, you can always email Ken directly. Uh, the next question is, how do you organize data within your business data lake in order to make sure you are able to retrieve the same data again two months later when you're trying to reproduce results uh, for older analysis. You want to read that one again? Yeah. Nope, I got it. Um, okay. From that perspective, um, you know, what's interesting is, you know, is I, I talked to Facebook about things once, and it, it is um, on the Hadoop side of things, there is, you know, some kind of organization that needs to be provided at the, the file system level. So as you are building your file structure, you need to, you know, incorporate, you know, whether it's directory structure or file name structure, you know, you have to have some standards around that, and that's really a key component to um, understanding, or like you say, recreating, or the, like the question said, uh, recreating something. If I ask a question on one day, I want to be able to make sure I can ask the same question, you know, two months later to, to, to validate it. Um, so from a, you know, a file system perspective, you know, that's really what HDFS is providing um, as a way to kind of do that is really just a, a structure around directories and then a structure around file naming conventions that would have to put in place. Obviously, if it's, once it's structured and it's loaded into or made available to, let's say, the Hawk query engine, now you've got you know, things hopefully in your data model that give you that repeatability. So in your data model, you'll need to, um, you know, have something that is date-specific or date-oriented or file name-oriented, et cetera, so that you know you can, you know, recreate the same answer, you know, with the same query. Okay, very good. And since you mentioned Hawk, I'll ask this next question. Um, does a Hawk server need to run on a standalone server, or is it deployed on an HDFS cluster? Oh, very good question. Architecturally, Hawk 
um, has the notion of what's called a database segment. Um, and that database segment actually runs on the data node uh, of HDFS. So it resides where the data resides on the, the name nodes, or excuse me, on the data nodes. So if you have you know, 100 data nodes, we are going to have Hawk running on 100 nodes um, coexisting with HDFS on the data node. Okay, very good. Uh, this next question is, what is it, or is there an equivalent of Data Mart in Data Lake? Hmm. I don't know if I've thought about that one yet. <laughs> I think there is, and to a certain extent. Um, and it, it might come down to semantics on this one, but what I li like to think of is we're providing to end users um, a way to directly access data and, and really give them a sandbox kind of environment. And that sandbox environment allows them to kind of work with subsets of data, um, work with data that may only be available to them that they've wanted to import specific for, let's say, a, a, you know, a, a line of business project or something like that. So it's kind of data mart-like, um, but, you know, it, it a lot is going to depend on the use case for that business because I can definitely see a reason. Maybe it's performance, maybe it's scalability to create a subset of a data or to provide a processing environment that's you know a mini data lake. I don't know if that's called a data pond at that point or what, but I don't want to make up terms on the fly. Um, that could meet just a, a subset of the business's needs. But okay. I like the data pond. Uh, yeah, the next question, which is sort of in line with uh, this last one, is uh, does a data lake replace an EDW or data mart? That's an excellent question as well. And in my opinion, no, it does not. I think they are very different use cases. Um, the, the data lake is really more um, about exploration and finding business value, using data science against raw data, using data science against you know, possibly incredibly large data volumes, et cetera, where I think, and it's really about exploring data to find business value, where I think an EDW, unfortunately, I think they started this way, but I think they've become more operationalized, and it's, hey, I need my report to run my business. You know, so the district manager that runs the West needs their sales reports you know, on Monday morning so that they know what's going on and how they plan their week, et cetera. And I think those use cases are, are very different. So I do not see, and I've actually had one customer say, oh, we're going to get rid of the, the data warehouse and do all this work over on the data lake. And I was like, yeah, no, you're, <laughs> you know, the tools are still maturing in the data lake space. So Hadoop and some of the query engines and some of those things are, you know, they're, they're, they're robust and they're good, but they're still in a maturing and a growth phase in terms of features and functionality, et cetera. Um, and I think they scale very well to large volumes of data, but they may not scale as well in terms of, hey, I want 500 users all running reports you know, against this type of environment. So I don't see a data lake replacing the EDW or a data mart. Okay, very good. And again, very thoughtful uh, answer to that question. Uh, I'm going to ask one more question, then we'll we'll move on. But it's, the question is, if you have no use for the quote raw data, but you have use for it in the processed form, why incur the cost of storing it in a data lake? I guess the the, the thing there is that if you've truly validated that, um, then I, I agree, don't store it. Um, a lot of times. Um, Companies don't think they need that, um, but yet when they do turn, you know, data scientists, et cetera, or the business loose with that data, they can find, um, you know, nuggets of gold and new pieces of information. Um, but then again, I, I mentioned earlier in the call, I talked to one company and their their detailed transaction data coming in was so raw. Um, and when they did give the users direct access to it, the users, you know, kind of just went, oh, yeah, careful what you ask for. So, you know, depending on your business model, you may not need that true raw data around. Um, and like I said, this is a, it's a very large uh, credit processing company, and they just went, 
you know, their their end users looked at the raw data and then said, oops, sorry, we really didn't mean to ask for that because it's too raw. So, you know, it, it can depend on your business, but um, oftentimes the raw data can be pretty interesting to see. Got it. Okay. Well, that'll have to be our last question. Uh, for those of you that asked questions and we had a lot come in, uh, rest assured we're going to send all of them to Ken and Pivotal and they will be able to respond to you directly. I just have a few quick announcements to make to please mark your calendars for our next Data Science Central webinar on July 22nd, Vision and Visualization, Practical Wisdom from Research in Human Vision, which is sponsored by Tableau. Uh, also, as I mentioned, this event is being taped and will be made available later on this afternoon at Data Science Central. Uh, on our homepage at the top tab, you can see it there. Now, this brings our webinar to a close. I'd like to thank our audience again for participating and some great questions. And a special thank you again to Pivotal and to Ken for their sponsorship and insight into today's topic. My name is Tim Madison. I'm very pleased to have been your host today, and I look forward to seeing you all again on July 22nd. Good day.